Christmas. So we had really great talks, but this afternoon, before diving into the talk, I would like everybody to get a little bit get up because you know we need to get our brains. So everybody, just get up. You see, my talks is always about penguins. So let's take a little bit like a penguin just to get a little bit, you know, awake. And let us grab. Here's a fish. Try to try to grab a fish. And throw the fish. All right. That's good. Thanks for getting up. Just uh, everybody's a little bit, you know. Awake, yeah, yeah. It's always, it's, it's great to listen to all great topics, but you know, at some point it's always a bit more. Now can, can I hear myself? So, as usual, thanks for having me here. Um, me and also the penguins are very, very happy to be here. Um, we heard already, already quite a bit about Kubernetes today. I will dive a little bit deeper, um, and I will talk about IPv6 only Kubernetes hosting without the dual stack thing. So a little bit of background before I dive into Kubernetes is why would you want to use it at all? That, I think that's a very valid question because Kubernetes is a huge complex system. It's an orchestrator for deploying tons of containers and pods, but is it actually worth it? That's, I think, always the first question to ask yourself. So what we do at Ungleich is we are running managed and unmanaged hostings. Unmanaged just being like virtual machines, same stuff they get at Azure. We also do managed hostings with a lot of different services. I'll come to this later. However, everything is 100% IPv6 enabled. There's not a single service that doesn't have IPv6. We have tons of services without IPv4, but none without IPv6. So when we approached Kubernetes, that was some years ago, I can tell you it wasn't the easiest path to come where we are today. Let me give you a little bit of an example of like what we actually do with Kubernetes or what we do in general with the managed applications. So we are running a lot of yeah, different applications, but it's all open source. You probably know most of them from Matrix as a chat tool, Nextcloud for data storage. We do tons of Django hostings for ourselves, for our customers, and we do Matrix again. Who checked those slides? Ah, anyway. Uh, obviously, we do also do the, the regular things like monitoring. We do network. Uh, Veronica mentioned it before, like one of the very, very famous tools, I think, for, for IPAM nowadays is Netbox, which is very easy to use. In a nutshell, we do a lot of different application hostings, and we need to find a way to put all of this together. How did we do it so far, like before the Kubernetes? We do have our own automation tool named CDIS, which is a configuration management system, which is similar to uh, Puppet, Chef, Ansible, you name it. You all know those tools. We really like, still like CDIS, and we actually use it for um, bootstrapping our Kubernetes nodes. And why don't we just continue doing it? Well, there are various reasons for it. And if you're in a large organization, you will notice that your developers, they tend to like containers. There are good reasons for that. There are bad reasons for it, but there are also good reasons for it. Um, then we also have our internal staff who also likes to use containers because they're sometimes easier to handle than the raw operating system where you need to have a look at all the different details of, for each application. So if I just go back to the previous slide, you see here, for instance, Matrix runs very well on, on Debian. Netbox, we are running, for instance, on Alpine. Uh, Prometheus, we are running on Alpine. Django Hosting, we are running on Alpine. Mastodon, we run again on Debian. So you always kind of have a zoo of operating systems that you don't need to care about when you're actually in the container world. Another thing, and this is the one thing I can really, really recommend if you're considering to go towards Kubernetes, is to think about GitOps as a flow. And GitOps basically just means you commit something in your version control and say, like, I would like to have this kind of state in my cluster. I want to have matrix of that version. I want to have next dot of that version. You commit it, you push it, and everything else is just being taken care of. That is the, from my perspective, the major advantage of going with containers, or Kubernetes for the matter, because containers alone don't give you that. So after many, many years, we were still kind of reluctant because Kubernetes is still it's a huge instrument, but we see that there are 
there are certain advantages of going with Kubernetes for managing infrastructure. Now, when you want to go to Kubernetes, and we, we've heard it a bit from the previous speakers, well, you do want your stuff to be reachable, especially if you're an IPv6 only hosting provider, you want the stuff to be <laughs> IPv6 only reachable. But Kubernetes is designed, and it's coming really from a world where there was only IPv4. And you can see this over the next 20 ish minutes that a lot of things inside Kubernetes are designed around concepts of the IPv4 world. Fernando gave good examples before that a lot of things are actually similar. You can deploy stuff similar. But conceptually, you think differently if you start with IPv6. And you never heard about IPv4, really. So that's a very different mindset. So when Kubernetes was released in 2015, there was around zero support for IPv6. In 2015, who would have thought IPv6, such a new thing, it was there for, remind me, 18 years? I don't know, 17, 18, yeah. My math is not so good. So what, what you got there was very interesting. You can already, like, in the next years from 2015 until it was actually fully supported, there are different modes of failures in Kubernetes because every daemon, because it's a huge set of things that you run, every daemon has to support IPv6. And the Kubernetes developers, they early introduced, like, all right, you can just pass me an IPv6 network and I will try to do the right thing for one or two of those daemons. I have 20, but for some. So over the years, you would deploy it and you would get different failures because some or more parts of the Kubernetes cluster would actually support IPv6. Until in uh, version 118, I think it was actually some versions before that inofficially IPv6 support worked, but officially it was there in 118, which is well around three years ago, not just that long ago. A little bit later, Kubernetes also introduced officially dual stack support for, for the networking stack. And why is that? The concept of Kubernetes is a pod has one IP address. And that one IP address can be either IPv4 or IPv6 for some time. That was changed with the version 123. A pod can officially have two IP addresses, one from each family, which is much better. So lesson learned, uh, it only took roughly six years from going from no IPv6 to dual stack support, which, you know, better than never learned. So when we look at Kubernetes, I think we, we kind of have to look at it from two different sides. One side is, does Kubernetes, the stack, support IPv6? Can I actually run hypothetically anything, my own application in it, that supports IPv6? Can I make it reachable IPv6-wise? This is, from my perspective, the Kubernetes stack itself. And then the other question is, well, you have tons of standard applications. Do they actually work properly? Does my Nginx work with IPv6? Does my other web server, my mail server, my application, does it actually support IPv6? Because it's great if my stack supports IPv6, but my application doesn't. Then, you know, half the problem solved is not solved. Some... Um, I would say rather famous examples there from my side. Um, Nginx, the web server, probably everybody who has come into touch with technology here has know, knows about it. It actually has a second directive where you need to say like, well, you need to listen on IPv4 and IPv6. So if you only do one, it doesn't work. Or Ceph, which is a very um, famous storage system, actually has a bind option. If you don't enable it, it doesn't listen on IPv6. But well, those are easily solved, if you know about it. We heard a little bit before about Kubernetes, how it's deployed in Azure today. I will focus it a little bit more on Kubernetes itself, so if you deploy it yourself, like what it actually can do. This is not about limitations of cloud providers, but more about what Kubernetes itself allows you to do. Generally speaking, Kubernetes actually doesn't really support networking, which is interesting. Because Kubernetes you know, has a lot of containers and needs to bring them together. But the only thing that it actually does support is something called container network interface. Which, you know, if you're looking at me like, what the fuck? 
I'm, I'm in the UK. Am I allowed to say that? Ah, wait. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> scratch that from recording. You can, you know, bleep. Um, well, so, coming back to that. So Kubernetes doesn't know about networking, it just knows it has an interface to networking. And the whole concept of Kubernetes is it has a lot of interfaces to a lot of things. Kubernetes also doesn't know how to run containers. Seriously, it doesn't. But Kubernetes has the container runtime interface, which might be Docker, which might be CRIO, which might be Portman, you name it. Which is good design-wise because it's abstract, but it's also bad design-wise because you have to know or you have to decide every time you're running Kubernetes, well, what kind of container runtime am I using? What kind of networking am I using? You have to take a decision if you run it yourself. Good news again, if you use a CNI, you can use a CNI that supports IPv6 or doesn't support IPv6, whatever you not want or whatever you need. I will give you three interesting examples. Uh, the one that we use quite often is named Calico. And uh, Calico is a bit of a beast of a CNI. It can do everything. Um, I mean, you read it here. It can do VLAN tagging. It can do IP and IP. It can do VXLAN. It can do WireGuard. Why would you want to do that? OK, maybe. Maybe it's a good idea. Yeah, maybe you can encrypt all the traffic. It's actually maybe not such a bad idea. And it can do BGP. And it's one of the main reasons why we're using it, because our community clusters are actually peering with our infrastructure to say, like, hey, the pod is over here, the service is over there, which is a really cool feature. The disadvantage is of Calico. It actually, when you deploy Calico, you actually have a daemon that is deploying Calico itself. You're not deploying Calico. It's kind of like the CNI that manages the CNI. So it's getting even one more layer of indirection there. However, and, and that is great, Calico even supported dual stack networking in Kubernetes when Kubernetes didn't support it because they just faked it. They just faked an IP address and gave the pods two IP addresses. So this is really amazing. Now, if you get a little bit of a, you know, pain in the stomach when you listen to that, then you might want to hear about Cilium. Because Cilium came much later and they were coming and saying like, well, we want to do very clean networking. We want to support IPv6, and they are the first ones actually to come out and they're saying, we support NUT64 inside the CNI, inside the plugin itself. Well, the only bug is that Cilium doesn't run when the hosts itself are IPv6 only. So it's almost thought through. That said, Cilium is a, it's a very, it's built-in, it's, it's a very nice plugin that actually uses eBPF, uh, the ones who know about it, uh, I don't have to explain. The other ones, eBPF, in a nutshell, is very fast in-kernel networking. That is a very interesting feature. Um, so, Cilium I put here on the slide because it is a very, very interesting CNI with a lot of potential. It even has nowadays also BGP support embedded, uh, I think, with the help of the uh, Metal LLB low balancer, the code was uh, included but it's not there yet if you're running IPv6-only data centers. So, yeah. Then, if your head is already spinning, let me try to get you like two levels back. So we had Calico, we had Cilium, they do a lot of things. If you just want to do very simple things such as take a network card of your host and put it to a container or a pod, then there are very, very simple plugins for that that are coming with Kubernetes itself. They're called reference plugins nowadays. They were included or they are kind of still included in Kubernetes nowadays, but they are called reference plugins as in, they're just there as an example, but they're fully functional and they work great in the, in the right situations. And if you just need to pass a network card into your container, those are actually quite interesting. Also interesting, they work perfectly with IPv6. That is, um, yeah, exactly. It's uh, good thing. So, I mentioned originally, Kubernetes is really from the mindset. It was May 2015, but people really didn't think, really didn't anticipate about the power that IPv6 gives. So, some of the things are very weird is the pods, basically the shell around the container, 
they're really designed to be in a private network. If you, like us, we use always uh, global unique addresses for our pods, so they are globally unique reachable. So if you don't put a firewall there, then all our workload, all our MySQL, Postgres, SQL databases, they're all worldwide reachable. Because conceptually, Kubernetes thinks a pod is somewhere in a safe land. I will come back to this later, how you actually fix this. Um, generally speaking also, communication between pods is unencrypted. So now thinking back about what, what Calico is doing with the WireGuard encryption optionally, it's actually not such a bad idea to encrypt traffic between nodes. And then Kubernetes has a very interesting concept that is called ingress. And everybody in the networking world has an understanding of what an ingress is. It's not what you think, because it's Kubernetes, so it's different. Um, an ingress in Kubernetes is basically an HTTP ingress, if you want so. It's not entirely true, but it's good enough for 95% for of the cases. Um, so basically, the Kubernetes idea is you have one entry point, because only that one entry point has a public IP address. The rest doesn't, which is not true if you're in the IPv6 world. So these are some of the notions which are not really a showstopper, but which are like really can see how people thought when they designed it. Now, good news. The Kubernetes pods running IPv6 only, they work smooth, they don't have any, any single problem. You can throw in your slash 64 network. It's brilliant, it behaves exactly like you want nowadays. Now, if you have your pods and you, if you want to isolate them from the rest of the world, which you might want to do, then you can use a very easy tool that's called network policy which basically says pods labeled with something are accessible from somewhere. In a nutshell, it's just a firewall embedded in Kubernetes, but actually quite a easy to handle one. Let's come to Kubernetes services. And for those who are not deeply into Kubernetes, a service is basically an abstraction to a number of pods. So you say you have a web service somewhere and your pods are ephemeral. They come and go and they change your IP addresses but the service stays here and always selects the pods which are right now alive and running. So they abstract away the IP address or the name to the pods. Now, services design-wise are internal. I put big quotes here because, you know, it's IPv6. So why should they be internal? Now, it gets even more funky because the designers of Kubernetes were thinking like, well, a service, there are only so and so many services in your cluster, so we will have a mapping table somewhere. The mapping table, we allocate the size of the maximum services beforehand. Does anybody see this going wrong? 64 bits, saving in a database? I think you're not going to do that. I mean, they are not. So what they did is actually saying like, well, services, we just limit it to 20-ish bits. This is what we can handle because nobody needs more than 604 kilobytes of RAM, huh? Same thinking. This is a very old bug, and it's been discussed for a long time, and it's eventually it's going to be fixed. On a serious note, coming from the IPv6 background, I really strongly dislike that. However, 20 bits of, of service IPs might be enough for most clusters, to be honest. So, not going to complain too much about this. Now, let's play a little bit with this. As I said, these, these services, they are really, really cool, and they often used as a resolution, a name resolution within Kubernetes. So if you want to reach from one service to another service, you can just use, you have namespaces in Kubernetes to isolate things. And what you can do is, like, you can say, my cluster has a domain that's called c2.kts.oo, which is a proper real internet domain, which is a real domain, which is effectively in use. And then Kubernetes says, like, well, every service will be put below svc dot your cluster domain. Also very easy. Now, a real service is then named your service name dot default, for instance, namespace dot svc dot c2 dot kds dot oo. And this is a really valid domain name. So with services in Kubernetes, you get automatic DNS for free for your services, which are internal. I'm uh, striking the quotes now. They're not really internal because they are worldwide reachable. This is a side effect of the designs of Kubernetes, which you can use. And you get fully global automatic DNS for your services. Nothing to be done. It's really cool. 
Going further into Kubernetes and the DNS. So Kubernetes is by default using core DNS nowadays. And core DNS supports DNS 6.4, which is also very welcome to see. So if you are deploying an IPv6 only network, you can just put your DNS 6.4, your NUT 6.4 prefix into it, and all the ports can reach uh, the internet. When you upgrade Kubernetes, it will tell you, hey, there's an option in the DNS server that I don't recognize, but I don't care. I will just continue and upgrade. So that also works nicely. Then another concept from, from the old world. Um, Kubernetes has this concept of a load balancer. Load balancers always have a public IP address or are intended to have a public IP address. Um, they are a bit more flexible than the ingress, um, but very similar notion. Uh, in, the, in the IPv6 world, you can do exactly the same thing with a service. And actually, running if you run on bare metal, it might be easier to run a service that does the same thing as a load balancer. So it's um, also a nice side effect of using IPv6. So then something that is a little bit, this is one of the biggest worries or the biggest complaints from my side about Kubernetes. Inside Kubernetes, the idea is you have a lot of different nodes. And on these nodes, somewhere your containers are. It's really cloudy. It's really concept cloud very well implemented because you have no clue where anything is running. It's, it's perfect. It really describes the cloud. And how the traffic is handled is there's a tool named QProxy. QProxy takes the traffic for any pod on any node and forwards it to the right node. Now, those of you who think like, oh, well, that's routing. That's something we, we developed like 40 years ago. That's something we don't know. Every, every network device can do. No, 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 not in Kubernetes. In Kubernetes, we take it as a proxy on a layer seven and we actually resend it with, a, with the IP address of the node to another node. So what you actually do is when anything that goes through QProxy loses the source IP address by default if you're not adding extra effort to actually keep the IP address there. So this is one of the biggest bugs that is really originating from the way how Kubernetes was designed in the early days. There are efforts to completely remove QProxy from Kubernetes. Um, Calico can do that, but only for uh, legacy, for IPv4 only clusters, not for IPv6. And Cilium also tries to remove it with using the eBPF uh, plane, data plane. So work in progress, but one of the weird things, if you see a lot of traffic from within your cluster, then it's just because IPs have been rewritten within the cluster. So in a nutshell, and, and this is, I think, the really, really good news from my side, Kubernetes works very fine with IPv6. That is Kubernetes, the technology itself. Concepts you can really see, like they're being dragged on from the legacy IP time. They don't stop you from using IPv6, but they also don't help you uh, deploying it. But there's nothing, I mean, we have heard before the examples from, from Azure and Amazon and co, where things are not fully, let's say, the way how you expect it, but it's more a limitation of the cloud provider, it's not a limitation of the community stack. So if you deploy it yourself, you can run it both IPv6 only and dual stack without any problem. Um, yeah, like I said, um, Cilium internally supports, in theory, NAT64. That's one of the things we really would like to explore because this is one of the hard things actually to do. And we're trying to get back actually with the Kubernetes community and the developers to revise all those concepts, whether they are still actually valid or whether they yeah, need to be rethought. That's it from my side. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, some things that I always put at the end is like, in case you're into IPv6, and there's a new thing, I always put a new thing here on the slide. So there's a new, must, everybody has heard about Twitter and shooting rockets into space, um, or not, for the matter. So in case you, you follow this development, there's now an IPv6 social Mastodon instance, so if you're into IPv6, and in a lot of other IPv6 chat. Again, that's from my side. I hope you enjoyed it. And yeah, if you have any questions, happy to hear them. Okay. 
Thank you very much, Nico. I can see a hand up. So one thing, the slash 108 limit has been raised to slash 64 two weeks ago in Kubernetes 1.27. So the bugs, well, bus, bug was eventually fixed. Uh, for IPv4, it's basically unlimited because you have just slash 32 in case you would need it. But it's, it's finally uh, one of the things that has right. been resolved. There are more to go. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot for the clarification. Well, that's great. Um, any more questions for Nico? No, so thank you very much. You have brought us almost back on time. So <laughs> as, a, as a class stereotype, the Swiss guy, you know. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> thank you so much.